Hi, welcome back. We are learning from the saw. And if we begin by looking at the demo class, we can see that our attention is going to center on this figure here. We brought the Tamandua to conclusion. And now we're going to be working on this figure here. So this was selected by a family member because we're very fond of sloths and we wanted to include it. Um, it's not really a problem to us that the shape of the sloth is improbable. It's unlikely that a sloth would hold on to uh, a branch in that way. So it just looks anatomically incorrect. Am I bothered? No, not really, because uh, in painting in Rousseau's style, um, yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, mistakes, imagination, uh, things that are, you know, apparently incorrect. And it's enough to know that the sloth is there and it's happily swinging from branch to branch. So what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, scoot over to the fill in camera and we're going to refresh the video source and um, hopefully um, see how the sloth was painted. Okay, so over to the fill in and there we go and we shall refresh the page and take it from the beginning okay thank you for your patience and now we're just going to look at uh, the entire work here we go again i had to do a little bit of research about the sloth which is occupying the upper right hand quadrant and all those times ago when we were looking at um, mapping out the four points of interest on a two-thirds grid, so two-thirds horizontally, two-thirds uh, vertically, where they cross to make a knots and crosses board, you get four points of interest. And this uh, sloth is occupying the um, upper right uh, point of interest. So it's roughly in the right space. I did some research about sloths. Uh, luckily, I got my color just about correctly. I'm working in um, Windsor and Newton water mixable oils. My mix is 50-50 water and uh, water soluble um, linseed oil from the Windsor and Newton artisan range. And although the palette is obscured by the reference photo, uh, I'm just using mixes of titanium white, a small amount of yellow ochre, and um, slightly more burnt umber and carbon black. In the last um, episode that I was um, um, uh, narrating not so long ago, I was telling uh, how uh, I allow the water mix to uh, get dirty in a sense and that helps temper all the colors and take the edge off the pure colors and um, it also helps you desaturate the colors for things like slots here i'm mapping in the eyes i'm just trying to get a sense of how the um you know the the facial portion uh, uh proportions of the slots face uh, are all mapped out because while being human-like there are very uh, uh, strong differences 
And you might have noticed just a moment ago, I was mixing with one brush, but then I was wiping the excess off onto the ferrule so that it was easier for these soft bristled um, Rosemary & Co uh, synthetic uh, blend uh, brushes to actually pick up decent amounts of colour more easily, more precisely for working in small detail. So that's a little trick that I've developed over the last little while. I use the metal ferrule at the um, you know, the end of the brush. You can see it, it's in the picture. And what I do is I wipe off excess paint there to build a kind of uh, dome and I can pick out very, very small amounts of colour and put it right on the very fine tip of the brush. Uh, so I can load the brush up there. Here I'm using a mix of mostly burnt umber and a little bit of carbon black to create the shadow area around about the neck to create a separation between the neck and the chest area. Creating a kind of v-neck uh, also creates a little bit of form on the sloth. So to me, the sloth's face resembles a kind of bowling ball with those two eyes and the little nose. They've also got very smiley faces, but uh, working small as I am, it's very difficult to put these little details in. So I try to in a moment. But working on the neck there, trying to um, cast some shadow. And there is, um, if you notice, there's a kind of um, sunglasses appearance to the eyes. So there's lines going from the side of the head into the eyes uh, on both sides. So that frames the face. And also there is a halo of dark round about the top of the uh, you know, the hair cut, the hair styling what I'm putting in right now. So there's a little dark halo there. Now to me, the separation between the light of the eyebrows and the forehead and the dark halo of the hair around the head is not enough. So I have to make sure that that dark is uh, really quite dark and I'll have to incorporate some more lights using my scrape back uh, scrofito technique where I can scrape back the layers. As you look at the photo you can see there's a highlight on the bridge of the nose and so that's something that I'm keen to try and include. But even at this stage here the face is coming together and I think now I try to suggest that little smile with those mannequin mouth uh, creases going down the way. So now it's got the kind of human, uh, human-esque appearance. The dull under colour is a mixture of burnt umber and a greater amount of titanium white. And here I'm using that uh, burnt umber to try and create the sense of form round about the armpit and the underside of the uh, reaching out arm. Similarly with the body and the separation of the belly and the left thigh as it faces towards us. So as I said, it's anatomically impossible <laughs> for this sloth to wrap one leg round the tree and the other one would have to be dangling backwards somewhere, gripping on. Uh, but they are very, very agile. Slow, but very supple. So it's possible that that other leg is wrapped around the tree uh, just above the bananas there. Umber means shade. And I'm putting in some shade to try and detail where the body shape uh, wraps around the branch. There's a shadow under both armpits now and I'm creating a shadow area on the right, the sloth's right gripping hand, not on the reaching hand. And later what I'll do is I'll try and make this sloth a um, three-toed sloth. But before I do that, 
I want to lighten up the belly a little bit more so I kind of make um, a sort of light patch on its belly with a, a buff titanium that I've made out of titanium white and uh, burnt umber um, just to create that light patch and also to suggest the highlighted areas from the sun which is going down behind it uh, so just a kind of subtle suggestion that there's a, a little bit of a highlight on it again several layers of um, the buff titanium is being added to the belly to create a roundness and a fullness there and also on the uh, left thigh to show where the highlights kind of match where the bone structure would be within uh, the leg there So um, I'm shading in a kind of way that is informed by the paintings of Ferdinand Leger. Uh, so have a look at his work and you'll see the kind of um, can cylindrical, um, cylindrical forms that he puts in. So that informed the painting of that a little bit. Now I'm becoming concerned with the, um, the light area of the brow and especially that highlight on the um, bridge of the nose and going over the forehead to ma map out where the eyebrows are. So again, it's a little bit more titanium white added to the buff mixture, which uh, you can't see from the palette because it's obscured by the reference photo. But the reference photo is absolutely essential at this moment. Okay, so slightly more by titanium white um, added to the nose in particular, not the eyebrows, but the nose, and also to bring out the light underbelly. So that now is the third application in that area, and the second application to kind of suggest the ropey stringiness of the fur of the sloth. I'm happy to say that in my travels, as I'm painting in the three toenails, um, uh, we were lucky enough to get close to slots in Costa Rica, but also in Florida. Uh, we went to a theme park um, and uh, were greeted at the door by uh, a human and their sloth uh, colleague. And we got a hug from a sloth, which was lovely. Uh, the ridge over the thigh where it meets the belly needed to be darkened somewhat and to my mind this application is a little bit too strong so I could uh, go in with a um, embossing tool I've mentioned this before as a as a technique or a trick that I use in my painting quite a lot so um, it's now a feature of my uh, painting style, my painting technique, to scrape back paint layers with an embossing tool. But here, shadow area underneath the belly and on the inside of that right hand where the shadow area meets the trunk of the tree. I don't have brushes fine enough in my set because I've got a very, very limited set of brushes. I've only got about eight brushes, six to eight brushes. Um, that's six to eight brushes. Uh, and I don't use all of the ones that I've got. So I tend to do the majority of my painting with um, um, ivory flats and um, uh, rigger brushes. Now for this next little while, I seem to have obscured all the painting and so I'm going to go silent for a while until uh, things clear up. There, reducing the reference photo, tidying up the page, 
Um, basically, I was trying to record on ManyCam, which is something that I use for my online English teaching. Um, so this is the first time I've actually set it up so we can see my painting, the reference photo and the palette uh, in live um, time. So now we can see a little bit more of this buff titanium which is being lightened progressively with the inclusion of titanium white. So opposite the shadow area on the inside of the gripping hand I need a lighter area to, so, to show where the three toes are uh, going to finally be scratched in uh, using the, the embossing tools from my Derwent drawing set. So Derwent are a good pencil company, but they've got really good accessories for drawing, such as um, a set of uh, embossing tools, which I use a lot in my drawing and now increasingly more so in my painting. A chin has been added just under the nose by using this light buff mixture, probably a mid-tone, not the lightest uh, value, but a mid-tone of it, trying to suggest a chin. And because of the work on the spectacle areas, the eyes need to be darkened a little bit more. That black was probably um, taken from um, a smear collected on another brush ferrule and a tiny little um, a tiny little smidgen taken off and just dabbed in. Okay, so now trying to dry brush some texture into the fur and on the top of the knuckles. Okay, a little bit more yellow ochre. If we look at the palette cam, a little bit more yellow ochre. It's possible that I'm painting in the the um, three toed sloth as three toes. There's a three toed sloth and a two toed sloth. Again, a little bit more application from there, rotating the brush in the paint to get good coverage. And now it becomes a little bit more complicated. So there's um, very little separation between each of the toes for detailing. Although I try a third toe. Uh, so these are quite tiny details and um, that's why it's necessary actually to use something like an embossing tool which can be sharpened to the to an ideal point. Thumbs up, quite happy with this. Quite happy with my sloth. It may mean that the video is coming to an end. We've got the sun on one end, the moon on the other, and things are looking good. So thank you for watching this with me. I hope you learned something and it inspires creativity wherever you happen to be. There, the sloth in its environment. So. Thanks again for viewing and hopefully we'll see you in the next installment where we hope to uh, focus maybe on the ocelot cats. Uh, my daughter requested those. So thanks for viewing. See you in the next one.